Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Yesenia Rojas Khalil, Assistant Professor in the Department of Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in the Division of Colorectal Surgery. I'd like to welcome all of the attendees and physicians from Latin America, the Middle East, and the U.S. As part of our mission to, prom to promote medical knowledge through educational programs, the International Center at Baylor St. Luke's in Houston, Texas, in collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine, is honored to host our eighth international virtual roundtable to our network of physicians, medical societies, and international medical community. Today's topic is rectal cancer quality improvement and impact of COVID-19. Our objectives for our roundtable today are first, to discuss how to reduce morbidity from ileostomies in the context of rectal cancer. And second, we will discuss recommendations for the management of rectal cancer during the times of COVID. First, uh, we will have the lecture presentation by our speaker, Dr. Adif Iqbal. Throughout his presentation, please feel free to submit questions via the chat box, which is located at the bottom right of your screen. After the presentation, we will open the virtual roundtable with questions, comments, and observations from our panelists and from the audience. Before introducing our speaker this afternoon, I would like to welcome our Latin American panelists who will join us after the presentation with their opinion. Please join me in welcoming uh, La Doctora Erika Ruiz Garcia from Mexico. Dr. Erika Ruiz received her medical and surgery degree from La Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM, and her medical oncology degree from El Hospital de Oncología, Centro Médico Nacional, Siglo XXI, in Mexico City. She is the president of the Medical Society and associate professor of the Department of Gastrointestinal Tumors and Translational Medicine Laboratory at the National Cancer Institute, INCAN, in Mexico City. She is a researcher, member of the National System of Investigators and Southwest Oncology Group in the US. Dr. Ruiz has authored more than 56 international and journals and 16 chapters in national and international books. Bienvenida, Doctora Ruiz. Next, I'd like, to, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eduardo Payet Mesa from Peru. Dr. Eduardo Payet graduated as a surgeon from La Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos in Lima, Peru, specializing in general and oncological surgery. He completed his abdominal oncology surgery residency at the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases, INEN. He obtained his master's in medicine from the Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia and a master's degree in health service management at ESAN. He is currently the institutional chief of the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases, INEN, and professor of surgery at the University Peruana Cayetano Heredia. Dr. Payet is a fellow of the National Cancer Center in Tokyo, Japan, and honorary assistant professor at St. Mark's Hospital in London, UK. Bienvenido, Dr. Payet. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you uh, both, both doctors for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we will be connecting with you right after the lecture to obtain your observations and comments and questions that you may have uh, from our lecture today. Now it is my privilege to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Adif Iqbal. Dr. Iqbal is the Chief of Colorectal Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine and also the Quality Director for the Michael E. DeBakey Department of Surgery at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Dr. Iqbal earned his medical degree from King Edwards Medical University. He completed a surgical research fellowship at Crichton University Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska, followed by a general surgery residency at the University of Missouri and a colon and rectal fellowship at Washington University, Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. Dr. Iqbal leads the colorectal surgery team and specializes in procedures for benign and malignant pathology of the colon, rectum, and the anus. He has a special interest in advanced lap laparoscopic and robotic surgical procedures for the colon and rectum, including sphincter-saving procedures for low rectal cancer. 
He is a member of the Baylor Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center and offers laparoscopic pouch procedures for ulcerative colitis and minimally invasive surgery for Crohn's disease. His clinical interests include robotic surgery, advanced laparoscopy, pelvic surgery, and surgical treatment of rectal cancer, including transanal endoscopic microsurgery. His research interests focus on health services and outcome-based translational research in colorectal pathology with a focus on rectal cancer outcomes and institution of enhanced recovery programs after surgery. He has over 130 research publications, presentations, and posters. Welcome, Dr. Iqbal. Thank you, Dr. Rojas Khalid. All right, so I guess I will start. Thank you for that awesome introduction, Dr. Rojas Khalil. We're uh, glad to have all of you on board, including Dr. Ruiz and Payet. So I will start sharing my screen. So as Dr. Rojas Khalil mentioned, we will be talking about rectal cancer quality improvement and the impact of COVID-19 on rectal cancer care. I have nothing to disclose. And uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is why are we even talking about rectal cancer? Is rectal cancer surgery different than colon cancer surgery? It is, and that is because the bony confines of the anatomic pelvis uh, prevent uh, things that we that pose new challenges. They lead to complications that are specific to pelvic surgery, such as presacral bleeding and autonomic nerve injury. Sorry, my uh, computer seems to have a mind of its own but they could lead to presacral bleeding and autonomic nerve injury, which are not really seen in other areas. Um, they also lead to local recurrence due to circumferential margin positivity and ureteral injury, uh, which is uh, also uh, more prevalent with rectal cancer surgery. The cost associated with rectal cancer surgery is uh, also high, as you can see in this study, from the UK that compared colon to rectosigmoid to rectal cancers during the initial phase that include surgical resection, the cost for rectal surgery was much higher than colon and rectosigmoid lesions. It, I apologize, I'm not sure why the presentation keeps skipping forward. It also leads to poorer quality of care, which is uh, inherent. By that, I mean the patients that have rectal cancer surgery, they have longer length of stay, they get readmitted more because of dehydration, typically from ileostomies, they have higher SSI and higher UTI rates. A vast majority of surgery for rectal cancer in the US at current is being performed by non-specialist and low volume hospitals. And there is plenty of data out there that uh, ties outcomes of uh, uh, any surgical procedure to specialists uh, taking care of the patient, as well as a uh, high volume surgeon in a high volume hospital, which is not currently the case in the US. The rates of permanent colostomy are variable and excessive. I'm sorry, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Uh, the rates of permanent colostomy are variable and excessive. Uh, these are damning statistics. At current, in the US, 40% of surgeons are doing only APRs, as in they are not doing a single anastomosis when it comes to rectal cancer surgery. And that is quite concerning because these APR surgeons, if you look at the, them and study them, have a higher mortality rate and longer length of stay. The, as opposed to the low anterior resection surgeons that anastomose are more specialized. Uh, so we might think that US offers good rectal cancer care, but oncologic outcomes, uh, at least in 2011, when this study was done, were quite poor compared to Europe. And uh, that was because of suboptimal adherence to evidence-based guidelines. I studied that when I was in University of Florida and we showed that stage one rectal cancer, which typically just needs uh, surgery and no chemotherapy or radiation, was getting neoadjuvant radiation at an increasing rate as the time uh, and years passed. Not only were we doing more neoadjuvant radiation, 
over time, but the increasing use of neoadjuvant radiation was not associated with less extensive surgical resection. And the neoadjuvant radiation was associated with reduced survival in stage one rectal cancer. So the poor state of rectal cancer uh, surgery continued with stage two and stage three cases in which uh, you know, the, we typically need neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, but if you do look at the, uh, these graphs, this shows that uh, we were not giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation to every individual, and it was worsening over time. Academic programs did perform, outperform community and comprehensive community programs in that respect. So what can be done? Well, we can do a total mesorectal excision, which as shown by Bill Heald uh, uh, from the UK has been associated with uh, better outcomes. Uh, it decreases uh, local recurrence rates. And for the non-surgeons in the group, it is essentially a technique of removing the rectum along with the mesorectal fascia uh, along embryologic planes. Um, so obviously that needs to be an essential core of any rectal cancer surgery. Uh, robotic surgery does have certain benefits deep down in the pelvis. Um, some of them are shown here and I will show these videos. Um, you can avoid an extraction incision. Uh, you can extract from the ileostomy or you can extract from the rectum, avoiding an extraction incision, which leads to uh, morbidity from uh, the uh, uh, pain uh, as well as uh, hernia uh, from the extraction site. The anastomosis can be done either in a stapled or a hand-sewn fashion. And this video will show, especially the non-surgeons in the group, how um, you, the robot really helps deep down in the pelvis. You will see that uh, the, the robotic procedure when You will see when the robotic procedure is being done deep down in the pelvis, the uh, arms of the robot are able to really move and have dexterity of motion that is beyond the ability of a human hand. And that in itself uh, really helps way down in the pelvis where you can see we're at right angle. Um, when we get down to the Waldire's fascia. So this is again anteriorly and then laterally. The outcome is that the patient has no extraction incision because we extracted from the ileostomy site, has uh, essentially four portholes with the drain going through one of the portholes and uh, the ileostomy where the extraction was done. Patient goes home day one after surgery without any narcotic pain medication and did well. This is a case of a robotic anastomosis, which was done in a hand-sewn fashion. Uh, the specimen has already been extracted from the rectum. Uh, and now we are doing a hand-sewn anastomosis. Um, I have found this technique to be faster than the stapled anastomotic technique that I will show in a minute. But essentially, I start from the back wall opposite to where the camera is. So typically the left side of the back wall with a running 3O V-lock 180 stitch taking thick bites because the robotic magnification uh, can mislead a surgeon to take thick thin bites which can then lead to an anastomotic failure. So thick bites cinching the tissues down because lack of haptic feedback does uh, prevent us from feeling that tissue cinching down, so you need to see it. At the edge of the back wall, you transition to a canal stitch, which for the non-surgeons is a, a stitch that goes from outside in and inside out on the other side. Then I start with a new uh, 3OV lock stitch on the other side of the back wall and head in the other direction, and once I'm past the back wall onto the anterior layer. Then I again switch to a Connell stitch, which will be shown right there. This is a transition to the Connell stitch and I will show it to you here. It's from outside in, inside out on that side and then outside in and inside out on the other side. And we keep going till 
you get to the very last one to two stitches and you may not be able to connell the last one to two stitches just because there's not enough visibility. And I just do a suture straight across full thickness. It is important to lay down the loops consciously when you're pulling on these stitches. And I do tie the ends of this barbed stitch even though you don't necessarily need to, but it helps me sleep better at night. So I do a uh, Lambert with three of interrupted sutures on top, and then do a leak test uh, with the patient out of Trendelenburg. This is the outcome again, four portholes from the robot, one uh, uh, incision from the assistant port and the patient goes home day one. This is the staple technique in which, again, the anastomosis uh, was first we resected, and that's the uh, specimen being extracted from the anus. And in this staple technique, we're doing a purse string on either side around the EA anastomosis, uh, uh, the, uh, around the EA stapler. This is the distal purse string that is going around the rectum with the pin extended out of the 29 EA stapler, which is what I typically use. Um, you don't have to go inside out, outside in. You can just do a bar, uh, baseball stitch as I'm showing here and complete it as I show there, cinch it down. It is not unusual to have to go twice around or you can just do an endo loop once you've gone around it to cinch it down completely around the pin. And this is the proximal purse string around the colonic end um, with around the anvil. And again, once you go circumferentially around the uh, anvil, you can place an endo loop or go around another time with the purse string to cinch it down to prevent, to prevent an anastomotic leak. Once this is done, then the anastomosis is fashioned as you otherwise would with the EA stapler, which I will show here in a minute. There we go. And again, leak test done, and the patient goes home day one with essentially four port sites. So can anything help? Uh, well, we've already talked about TME and robotic surgery. There are newer techniques such as transanal TME in which we do what we've already shown you, uh, TME from above, except for in addition for really low rectal cancer uh, that is close to the sphincter, uh, especially in patients who are male and obese, we can put in uh, another port uh, and insufflate the rectum and uh, close off the distal edge followed by distal division under a vision uh, beyond the tumor followed by a TME in that plane. You meet with the TME plane from above and it really helps uh, our dissection. This bottom part can be done laparoscopically or robotically. So, what else can help? It's essential to do QI projects or quality improvement projects. I will share with you some projects that we've done. So this is an ileostomy related morbidity reduction project. And I will share you my story from uh, my previous institution where when I joined in 2011, we had a mean length of stay of 17 days, which was two and a half times worse than national average and 65% readmission rate, which was quite damning. When we looked at that in detail, most of the readmissions were from patients with ileostomies and most of those were from dehydration. So we decided to uh, address that. The first thing I did was institute an ileostomy phone call protocol in which we essentially called the patient for uh, a week after their discharge and talked about their intake and output and preempted an admission by recognizing dehydration uh, early and uh, making sure their intake was more than their output. What did that do? So 30, within uh, uh, a year before to a year after comparing the intervention, we went from 65% a year before to 16% readmission rate a year after. If the patients were readmitted, the length of stay went from four days to three days, and the cost of readmission decreased from 88,000 to almost $25,000. So significant difference. And a cost analysis was done. It's a busy slide. You really don't have to look at everything, but you look at that number. The total cost savings was $174,000 over just one year with only two surgeons uh, doing colorectal surgery. So quite significant. What did that do to our numbers? Well, we weren't as bad anymore, but we were. our length of stay index was still above one, which, which meant we were still worse than national average. The readmission decreased. 
We instituted an ERAS protocol, which is enhanced recovery after surgery. And uh, that brought our index to below national average. But I still saw that we were essentially rounding on these patients with the ileostomies and they had high ileostomy output. We would just, you know, adjust their Imodium or Lomotil and uh, wait another day. So I said, why can we not move this to the outpatient setting? So instituted an early discharge protocol by which we were putting in PIC lines or midline catheters day one after surgery. Social service was consulted to uh, um, have home health arranged for the midline, as well as a liter uh, to half a liter of IV fluid every night after discharge. Patients would be started on a regular diet and they would be discharged home when the patient was otherwise clinically ready. We would essentially ignore their ileostomy output because then we would daily call them uh, and escalate their medications to control their ileostomy output. Whenever their intake was more than their ileostomy output, the midline would be discontinued. And I also standardized the uh, discussion over the phone, which was essentially increasing doses of uh, increasing fiber, increasing doses of Imodium, Lamotil, cholestyramine, and tincture of opium. Nothing fancy about that, but everything was standardized. What did that do? That decreased our index to half of national average and readmission rates also went further down. So comparing where we were and where we ended, we went from a length of stay of 17 days to five days, being two and a half times worse than national average to half of national average almost, with the readmission rate decreasing from 65 to 14%. If the patients were readmitted, the readmission length of stay went from almost 14 days to almost four days. And the percentage of readmissions due to dehydration went down significantly. And the mean cost of both the original index procedure as well as the readmission went down significantly. You would ask what happened with all those midlines and pick lines you put in. No DVTs, no line infections, because really uh, these are staying in an average of seven to eight days max. We also, as a result of our enhanced recovery after surgery protocol, I can show you some data regarding narcotic usage reduction. Uh, again, nothing extra special about the protocol except for its multimodal narcotic sparing analgesia in which we every patient gets a spinal, uh, regardless of whether it's a minimally invasive case or not. Every patient, <clears throat> excuse me, every patient gets gabapentin, Tylenol, some sort of NSAID, um, and that covers from pre-op to post-op uh, if they need more pain medication then they get uh, narcotics relatively sparingly. So we compared our uh, uh, patient population from before versus after institution of enhanced recovery after surgery protocol and there was no difference in any metric. Uh, however, narcotic usage went significantly down both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. As you can see here, PCA usage was down significantly. This is not usage of PCA. This is any patient getting any PCA. So the number of patients using not, not using PCA increased significantly. Uh, and this is any patient getting PRN oral narcotic, even one of them. So patients were 83% were receiving narcotics before and 32% were receiving narcotics orally afterwards as an inpatient. Outpatient, it went from 80% needing outpatient narcotic scripts to 20% needing any outpatient narcotic scripts. But this tells only half the picture. What about the ones that did need narcotic scripts? How much narcotics did they need? If you look at the first graph on each of these images, essentially peanuts compared to before. So in case uh, of uh, the inpatients, the, we decreased significantly in terms of the morphine equivalent dosage, the inpatient PCA use from 1254 to 23, inpatient PRN IV dose, inpatient PRN oral dose of narcotics, and total outpatient oral dose prescribed. So in short, the mean total narcotic dose and morphine equivalents went from almost 2,500 to 300 milligrams for uh, this post-ERAS population, which was a significant decrease. You can ask, did that affect pain scores? It did not. Uh, it did not change the pain scores significantly. So then we said, can we de detect these difficult pelvic cases before we get into the uh, dissection in the pelvis? Because then it's probably too late. So we looked at our cases that were done for rectal cancer 
uh, over a period of time and uh, instituted uh, uh, certain parameters to be able to divide them into difficult or easy or routine cases. These parameters include uh, included intraoperative conversion from an LAR to an APR. If another surgeon had to come in to help, if the surgeon you thought uh, that uh, the case was difficult based on billing parameters, um, we ended up uh, classifying it as a difficult case, and we then developed a pelvic surgery difficulty index as follows. Each case uh, was reviewed, and the preoperative imaging was used to uh, basically get these 16 measurements off of their imaging. And these included all these measurements shown here. And when we compared the routine to difficult cases, no surprise, essentially this is a pictorial depiction of what a routine case's pelvis looked like and a difficult case's pelvis looked like. So a difficult pelvis that was significantly more narrow with the pelvic inlet, more narrow in the mid pelvis, more narrow with the pelvic outlet, had less pelvic volume, had a, a longer pelvis, had a more angled, angled sacrum, and a more acute anorectal angle. So, no surprise there, we all knew as surgeons that this was happening, we just proved it objectively. But more importantly, the difficult cases, uh, we were spending significantly more time in the operating room, more blood loss, more hospital stay, and more cost. Uh, when we looked for risk factors for the difficult pelvis, not surprising, higher BMI, male gender, previous radiation, and certain uh, measurements came uh, about as independent risk factors in multivariate analysis. So we then made a practical prediction model by choosing three factors with the strongest association with the difficult case, gave them a score of one each, and these were male gender, history of neoadjuvant radiation, and the length from the promontory to pelvic floor of more than 13 centimeters. So when we stratify with the PSDI or pelvic surgery difficulty index, which has four uh, you know, possible options, zero, one, two, three, um, there was significantly more blood loss as we go up on the PSDI score, more operative time, more length of stay, more cost, more SSIs, and more autonomic nerve, nerve injury as you go up. So obviously had to validate it in another set of uh, rectal cancer patients, and we did that, and we showed this exact same findings, and there was more autonomic nerve injury in the difficult cases as well. And this was the ROC curve, with the area under curve being 0.913, which is very, very good for a prediction model. Let's talk about the last portion of my talk, which is the impact of COVID-19 on rectal cancer care. As you all know, COVID-19 has impacted everything in our life, and uh, it has also impacted our ability to take care of these patients. Preoperatively, it prevents us from early diagnosis of, this, uh, uh, of these cancers, as well as the complications uh, arising postoperatively. It also prevents our patients from meeting the stoma nurses and getting educated because of uh, COVID restrictions. Intra and postoperatively, the reductions in staffing and resources may result in decreased colorectal screening. So future diagnosis uh, could be at an advanced stage. Um, isolation from the usual support system within the hospital and afterwards has uh, led to certain uh, uh, issues in terms of uh, patients uh, not being cared for appropriately, and patients with cancer are also at higher risk of contracting the virus. So how does rectal cancer care impact patients that have COVID-19? Well, cancer patients do suffer a more severe course of uh, the illness. Uh, Post-COVID surgery within the one month of infection appears to have an increased risk of post-operative morbidity and mortality. And this includes asymptomatic carriers, which a lot of us might be and never, would never know. So what are the recommendations during COVID? For stage one, before COVID, the recommendation was TME or total mesorectal excision surgery without any preoperative chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Both during COVID, for T1 rectal cancer specifically, we can try to be more liberal for uh, uh, adequate T1s that are small sized uh, in terms of local excision, which can be done transanally or endoscopically. Uh, Although patients that do have a high risk feature identified uh, on the excision should have a completion TME at a time that is considered safe from COVID-19 or 
uh, they should get adjuvant chemo radiation if they're unwilling to pursue TME or if COVID-19 uh, delays surgery uh, for a long period of time in your region. What about stage two and three cancers? The whole idea is to optimize the treatment to minimize patient provider contact. So there are two considerations. One is short course radiation therapy over long course in the setting of COVID-19. Well, this Stockholm 3 trial essentially showed that patients uh, were divided into three different groups, short course radiation with immediate surgery, short course with delayed surgery, and long course with uh, uh, delayed surgery. The short course with delayed surgery won, which is why we are recommending short course uh, radiation therapy over long course because of several reasons. Short course is oncologically similar to long course radiation, but uh, it also lead, leads to fewer encounters for patients, thus less exposure to both patients and clinicians, and more patients can be treated if the resources and staffing is limited in your facility. We also favor neoadjuvant chemotherapy over adjuvant chemotherapy, and uh, there's, plan there's data coming out that that is the way to go. So from a practical consideration, what do we do with stage two and three cancers? One option is, there are many options obviously, but one option is to consider short course radiation followed by TNT chemotherapy and then delay their surgery till it's safe to operate. That comes out of the RAPIDO trial, which just recently at ASCO um, uh, showed the results of 920 patients with advanced, locally advanced uh, uh, rectal cancer which were enrolled and they were randomized to one of these two groups. The standard arm was chemo radiation followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. But then the intervention arm was short course radiation followed by adjuvant chemotherapy or TN, sorry, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, TNT chemotherapy followed by surgery. They did not delay surgery to, uh, for a long period, but still the results showed that the short course radiation arm had better results higher pathologic complete response rate at the time of surgery, which was significant, and lower rate of disease-related treatment failure, which was due to a lower rate of distant metastasis at three years. Hence, uh, that's the recommendation, and I thank you for listening. I will stop sharing and see if we have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal, for such a great presentation. I like now to uh, would like to open the talk and for questions and comments from our panelists. Um, uh, why don't we start with you, Dr. Reese, uh, joining us from Mexico? Do you have any questions or comments about the talk? Thank you so much. Well, I have two things to say. The first is a question for Dr. Iqbal. I would like to know, for example, trying to avoid the complications of the ileostomies is what about if closing the ileostomy two or three weeks before the chemotherapy start? What do you think about that approach? That's an excellent question, Dr. Ruiz. Uh, so, you know, early closure of, of ileostomy uh, does really impact multiple things. Uh, most importantly, quality of life for patients because ileostomy-related morbidity is a real deal. And those of us who take care of ileostomies know it to be uh, impactful on the patient's uh, ability to have a good quality of life. And not only that, but uh, chemotherapy, which leads to further diarrhea, worsens our ability to care, take care of them in terms of dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. There is... Uh, there is some data to suggest that it is uh, okay to reverse the ileostomy early. Um, I think that the way we are headed at this point in time towards total neoadjuvant chemotherapy, this might end up being a mute point because uh, if TNT chemotherapy becomes this next standard of care, then we would be able to reverse the ileostomy because the patients would not be needing chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. But at this point in time, we are still delaying their ileostomy reversal till, till, till they're done with the chemotherapy. Although, you know, there are patients have had ileostomy reversals as early as 10 days after surgery, as long as the anastomosis is, uh, uh, you know, intact and uh, they do fine. So in select cases, it's a perfectly viable approach, but we do really need a study focused on that. Okay. 
Thank you so much. And just another question, because your talk was excellent, you cover everything. And this question has to be with, is related with COVID-19. Uh, for those patients that you're taking into the surgery room, are you doing the test, the PCR test before the surgery? That's, that's the way you're doing right now? Yes, right now. So uh, nobody can have uh, elective or uh, urgent surgery unless it's an emergency without a negative COVID test. And we're doing okay. a PCR test within five days of surgery. And then we tell them uh, to uh, self-isolate at home. Yeah, I, I did that question because it is so important. You know, now in Mexico, we have a lot of COVID-19 with cancer patients. Uh, where I work is the National Cancer Institute. So we attend only cancer patients. And in the first days when the Uh, the pandemic was just racing. Uh, the um, incidence was about 15%, even in those patients that were asymptomatic. So it was so important to establish this PCR test before surgery. Now that we uh, we haven't flat the curve, well, we flat the curve, uh, it's still between eight and 10% the incidence in asymptomatic patients. So as you say, it's very important to have the test done because the complications after the surgery in the COVID-19 positive patients, it's terrible, right? It is, I mean, we're, we're essentially, uh, by operating on a COVID-19 patient, even if they're an asymptomatic carrier, we're putting both the patient at risk as well as the entire staff at risk. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's, that's a, a chain reaction. Once that starts pretty quickly, the whole unit Uh, can be out of commission for a few weeks and that can have a devastating effect. So excellent question. It is essential that anyone who is doing these procedures uh, um, on a somewhat elective basis do a negative, have a negative COVID test within a few days of surgery. Ideally, if you have the option of doing it right there and then before surgery, sure, but most of us may not have that option. And in that case, do it within the last four or five days of surgery and then have the patient self-isolate. Thank you, Dr. Reese, for your question. Um, now I'd like to uh, address Dr. Payet. Um, please share your thoughts, uh, questions or comments about the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Yesenia. Uh, well, congratulations to Dr. Iqbal. It was a beautiful conference, uh, conference and lecture. Uh, 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 I am, as, as a surgeon, uh, was very, very impressed because of the, uh, the very, very nice uh, total mesorectal excision you made, uh, despite it was a very short part of the, of the video. But I, I was wondering, uh, I mean, is that the standard of care surgical, surgically at Baylor's? Or, and, and what is the status of in the United States? I was wondering about those rates of not sufficient surgery done in the United States. So that almost 40% uh, were not done by specialized. So what's the rate of in the United States or of uh, not of open surgery versus laparoscopic or robotic? Do you have those numbers? And if you could comment as well in your procedure, the local recurrence rate. Yes, thank you, Dr. Payet. Excellent questions. Um, so uh, in terms of what is uh, the standard in the US, you know, when that study came about, uh, the study that I showed was uh, essentially the study that led to uh, the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer within the US, which is a, a accreditation program for hospitals so that they, they meet at least the benchmark standard that uh, we all think is needed uh, by um, an institution to take care of these rectal cancer patients because we all know that these patients are complicated patients. They need medical oncology care, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. They need multi -D in, multidisciplinary input and tumor board. Um, and most places taking care of these patients probably did not have that and probably do not have that at present also. So um, that the, the, the same uh, protocol has been followed all over Europe and they've done it in the last 15 years. Um, 
each country within Europe, starting from, I believe, Norway, and then it has gone through all, most of Europe at this point, has established a national accreditation program, uh, which is similar to what the US has done now. Um, and they have led to a, a gradual improvement in care and quality of care uh, being offered to these rectal cancer patients. And that has led to uh, improved outcomes as well. Uh, which is uh, what I mentioned uh, in my talk, uh, rectal cancer uh, patients in the US, although we think we take it great care of patients, uh, the outcomes were quite poor compared to Europe because of that very reason. Uh, so now that the NAPRC has been established and more and more institutions are signing up to it, but the hope is that we will see a gradual rising of the water, so to speak, and everybody will benefit from it. But the thought is that oh, more than 50% of procedures are still being done open, uh, even for colon. So rectal numbers are going to be even worse. And there's, it's hard to argue for robotic surgery for everybody at this point because of the, you know, the not, there not being any hard evidence or data to support that in terms of oncologic outcomes. Um, we thought at one time that laparoscopy was good for rectal cancer, but then along came uh, ACOSOG Z6051 and the, uh, Ella, and the Ella Cart study from Australia, and they both showed that uh, laparoscopy may not be the way to go for uh, patients with distal rectal cancer because of uh, higher, uh, uh, because it failed to show non-inferiority to the open approach. Uh, robotic surgery uh, hasn't really shown superiority, but as I mentioned, for those of us who do robotic surgery deep down in the pelvis, there is a big difference in what you can accomplish with the robot, what you can see and what you can do, as opposed to uh, uh, either laparoscopic or sometimes open surgery. So it's not mainstream by any stretch. Um, we at Baylor are doing something at the forefront of uh, surgical medicine here, but uh, the hope is that over time we can train uh, more and more individuals to uh, uh, do what we think is right for our patients. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, what about what are your think your thoughts about watching weight procedures? Do you think do you consider in your patients uh, organ preservation? Absolutely, do. Uh, Again, like anything else, uh, organ preservation, uh, as shown by the Habergama group in uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. is, is safely done if you have uh, the right resources and the right patient. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be a patient that is going to, well, firstly, is on board with the plan. So mm -hmm. our protocol is that we typically do uh, an MRI, uh, usually about six to eight weeks after the new adjuvant therapy, followed by a flexible endosc endoscopy to evaluate the extent of response to neoadjuvant therapy. And if the patient has had a complete or near complete response, then we will have a chat about watch and bait versus uh, uh, surgical resection. And I'm open with them in terms of giving them numbers for both, the pros and cons of both. And I essentially let my patients decide uh, because uh, they need to be invested in that decision. While the watch and wait approach does offer an organ sparing approach, there is improved quality of life, one could argue, in terms of uh, not removing the rectum. But then there is a life, there's a need for ongoing surveillance and cost and uh, time that comes into play uh, and the potential for the need for uh, salvage surgery. So um, I essentially let my patients decide. And if it is the right patient that we know will follow up, then we're more than happy to offer them watch and wait. Thank you very much. Thank you. What do you do, I'm curious, uh, down there? Yes, well, uh, in Peru, they, the incidence of uh, colorectal cancer is not very high as we are seeing in, in, in United States or Europe, or inclusive if we compare to, to Argentina or Brazil. Uh, it's not the most, we have the more gastric cancer problem in gastrointestinal. So uh, yes, we are seeing more distal rectal cancer, adenocarcinomas, uh, more distal cancer than middle or proximal. And we are including all of them in chemo radiotherapy. Uh, uh, so we are seeing 
since 10 years ago, uh, uh, following more or less the Brazilian school. And of course, uh, the, the one at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as well. So uh, we are following getting some cases with clinical complete response. But of course, uh, our numbers interesting of APR resections are becoming very low. And we are doing more, of course, open. And some of our cases lack no robotic uh, 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 performing sphincter uh, preservation procedures. And this comes to me to another question. Those cases that you are performing radiotherapy and neoadjuvant therapy or induction, if you follow TNT as well, uh, how do you include them, them in, in robotic surgery as well? In robotic yes. resection? Any I have all? changed my practice uh, a few years ago now to Anyone uh, that needs a deep pelvic dissection, I do them robotically because I just see the benefit of operating with the robot in terms of the ease of dissection being so much easier. And it's surprising because when you remove the specimen at the end and look at that narrow pelvis, sometimes we're surprised as to how I never felt throughout the case that the case was actually that difficult. So I have switched completely to the robot uh, in deep pelvic dissections for any reason. Well, I have a lot of questions and comments, but I, I, I think Dr. Ruiz would like to make also some. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I would like to say that, for example, here in Mexico, we are having more colorectal cancer cases, and this in young population, one in every five patients are under 40s. So this is very interesting. I know this is a trendy thing worldwide, but it is very important to say that we have more and more cases with rectal cancer for the youngest people. And sadly, we receive over 150 new cases for rectal cancer. Most of them, we can say that 60% are locally advanced. So normally we deal with the ugly tumor because it's in the lower third and there are very, uh, very big so it, it some, since some time ago, uh, since the publication from Garcia Aguilar, we started doing these TNTs knowing that it was a phase two trials. But because we have these great volumes, we decided to put the chemotherapy after the chemoradiotherapy. And some of these young patients respond very, very well, but not as well as the oldest. And I think one big problem that we're facing are these tumors that they do not respond and the patient also, they are metabolic well, so they, they are not going to, to die soon. And the pain that they have and the quality of life, it's, it's so difficult. I would like to know, Dr. Iqbal and Dr. Payet, if you're dealing also with these issues in the youngest population because we need to do something. It's not just about the screening, but we need to do something about the treatment in these youngest people. Definitely, that's, that's an excellent question, Dr. Ruiz. And we, I am seeing the same thing in the US. We are seeing increasing incidence of rectal cancer in the youngest population. I have operated on patients as young as 17 year old with mm -hmm. uh, needing APR. So, uh, and the disease, uh, you know, I did a study uh, through the National Cancer Database looking at the younger, which means less than 50 years of age versus more than 50 years of age patients with rectal cancer, uh, specifically stage two and three rectal cancer. We found that firstly, the incidence is increasing. Secondly, mm -hmm. these patients are coming in at a higher stage than mm -hmm. uh, otherwise with the older population, probably because of screening, but that's just a conjecture. And thirdly, most importantly, the point you said, uh, we showed that for stage two and stage three rectal cancer patients that were younger than 50 years of age, they did not have any significant response to what we have established as standard of care for the older population, which is chemoradiation. So they did not respond to neoadjuvant chemoradiation in terms of their survival at all. 
so uh, that was, uh, you know, one of the take home messages from that study. The older population improved survival with their uh, with chemotherapy. The younger population did not. So there is something inherently biologically different about these tumors that we still don't know about. But yeah, I'd be curious to see if Dr. Payet is uh, seeing something similar. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, of course, most of our patients are people, are older people. And of course, I remember several years ago, I had a patient with adenocarcinoma of the rectum that was six years old. So in that patient, we performed an APR resection. That was many years ago, and he had survived. Now he's, he's more than 30 years. So, uh, 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 I mean, cancer, you can see cancer in a, any age, but it's very inter interesting. What are you doing for Lynch syndrome tumors? Are you doing performing proctocolectomies or, or you are doing partial dissection for these cases? So it depends on the patient. <laughs> so if it's a patient that I is reliable and I think they will uh, come back and do screening with us, then yes. I'll just do a partial and uh, do a colonoscopy every year. Uh, if it's a patient that is not reliable, then we'll do a total proctocolectomy, to total colectomy or a total proctocolectomy, de depending on the type. Yeah, but, I will uh, ask that. Yes. Yeah. And of course, all of these patients will have a genetic uh, study. Yes. 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 That's key. Genetic counselor, eval, and yes. Right. Thank you, Dr. Reese and Dr. Payet for those very thoughtful questions. I do want, we do have a few questions from the chat group that I'd like to address uh, or hope that you can address. So one of them keeping in the topic with um, cancer and younger patients, you know, there's a lot uh, in social media currently uh, with the passing of, of the Black Panther, at least in the U.S., it, it has brought up the attention to many and the awareness of cancer. Um, you talked about a little bit touched on, you know, we don't know exactly what it is. Certainly, we know that their response to the therapy is different to what we see in our older patients. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the screening is for uh, patients for colon and rectal cancer in the US? Any updates to those guidelines? And then I'm also interested in hearing if uh, what, what it is in Mexico and, and in Peru. Thank you, Dr. Rojas Khalil. Um, yes, Chadwick Bozeman was unfortunate and I think he was 43, so that's, yeah. uh, that's concerning. But uh, the, there are basically you know, two societies that uh, have different guidelines at this point. Uh, they both agreed initially that it was 50 years for a person uh, with average risk. But uh, recently, American Can Cancer Society uh, decreased it to 45 years, while the other society is still at 50 years. But that essentially shows you the realization of what we're all talking about and seeing in our daily practices. This is something that's on the rise, and I would not be surprised if the screening guidelines are changed further. I would like to address to the, what Dr. Ikbak said, that it is very sad that the screening programs for colorectal cancer are not as successful as breast cancer. Uh, maybe because people do not like colon or they think that's very ugly and disgust organ, but only two, between two and, four, two and four people in every 10, they do the screening. So that's very sad. Many years ago, we were saying that we need like a famous person to talk about colorectal. Maybe someone with a big butt like Jennifer Lopez or Kardashian or I don't know who, but someone that put that issue that colorectal cancer is getting uh, worse in, in terms of that there are more people and following the ACS guidelines in 2018, yes, we are trying to convince our, our patients here in Mexico to do the screening. But you know, it's very difficult because people are afraid, I don't know why, to a colonoscopy. And the fit, a test, it is not so important for the people. So it's like a fighting with the minds of the youngest and the oldest persons here um, like I already said we need somebody very famous to point out that this is a health problem 
I don't know if you know that in 2013, uh, Belgium made a very good uh, uh, publicity about screening, colorectal screening, using Brad Pitt, uh, but mm. without asking him. So they <laughs> sent a letter saying you need to do this feed test because you're in the 50s, so you can have colorectal cancer. But the impressive of this uh, public advice, uh, uh, advertising uh, uh, campaign was that over 5 million people uh, resent this letter to him. Well, it, the, it was supposed to get to him. So they send it like um, they make vital the letter and after five million people uh maybe some of those know that there was a special test and they did it because they want to do the same as maybe brad pitt was going to do so brad pitt didn't do anything but the most important was people know about the test so i need that we need some special screening programs maybe focus uh, in a different way that we do it in the normal way yes that's true that's that's a very good point i think uh a lot of it has to do with the attention of social social media and the funding and you know i think our societies at least um our society of colorectal surgery has really really taken on social media to try to promote um uh you know awareness in colon cancer and encourage patients uh for screening but yeah. But I agree. I think uh, we should take advantage of that. As, as a society, we're trying to uh, use those re resources, which really are, are free and a lot of patients and can subscribe to and can reach a, a large volume. But um, if I could say something, uh, Dr. Luis and myself work at national cancer institutes in our countries, mm -hmm. in countries that are middle income countries or, or developing countries. So the issue is about national cancer plans or cancer national plans. So which is very, very difficult to apply, maybe for cervical and maybe for gastric cancer, but for colorectal, I mean, what's the rate of of accessing the population for colonoscopy or blood test exam. So it's quite a difficult issue to, to apply in our countries, maybe. Yes, very, very true. Uh, Dr. Iqbal, there is another, uh, we do have another question um, here uh, in the chat. Um, our viewers are interested in knowing what is the percent uh, the percentage of colon cancer compared to other cancers. Uh, I guess specifically in the U.S. and other countries. Um, you know, is it number one, number two, or number three of what cancers we see in the U.S. And also, are most of the cancers that we're seeing at Baylor St. Luke's are they typically uh, being able to treat surgically, or do they often require? Um, multimodal therapy, which includes the radiation and the chemotherapy. What are you seeing at, at Baylor? So a great question. Uh, cancer is, a, a colorectal cancer is the third most common uh, cancer in the U.S. Um, and uh, in terms of what we are seeing from a rectal cancer standpoint, uh, it's most, it's uncommon for us to catch them early, uh, as in stage one. Most rectal cancers are stage two or three and need neoadjuvant uh, chemoradiation therapy. Uh, now with screening and uh, aggressive screening, uh, the, you can, you know, you would argue that we're catching more, more and more of these cancers at an earlier stage and that may be true for colon but doesn't seem to apply to rectum as much. Not sure why. Dr. Reitz, uh, Dr. Um, Payet, uh, any any further questions before we kind of summarize here and and end our talk? Well, I would like to thank to the Baylor College and also to Dr. Rojas and Dr. Iqbal and of course Dr. Payet to this very nice meeting. Hopefully, we can do it more frequently about colorectal because there is a need there. We're having more and more patients and physicians need to know more about this uh, disease. 
As Dr. Iqbal said, also here in Mexico, many of the patients are treated by non-specialists. So hopefully, if the patients know who are the specialists that have to treatment, maybe we can change a little bit the prognosis if the patient has been, uh, has been uh, treated by a non-specialist. Dr. Payet, any thoughts? Yes, well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think the experience that Dr. Iqbal has shown us in, in Baylor, of course, uh, it's, I mean, it's a dream for all other countries. I think that the experience you are having and you're talking and you're giving to the world is a lesson for improving for, 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 for other countries. I think it's a, a little far from reality for us, a country where we are used to see advanced cancer in general. We, colorectal cancer is not as common as breast cancer or prostate cancer in Peru. It's the six, number six for considering both sexes, but uh, together, but uh, uh, the standard of care must be, depends on the reality of the country and the uh, ability, but surgeons and medicals and the staff in, in, in total must be prepared for the future, especially for the young generations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Iqbal, any, any final comments or response? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ross Khalil, for excellent moderation, and Dr. Ruiz and Payet for your uh, awesome uh, commentary and uh, suggestions. Um, thank you to Baylor College of Medicine, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center for organizing this. Um, I agree, we should talk about this more and more, and maybe in the future we can talk about something more specific. Uh, we can maybe talk about surgical technique or whatever you want, uh, our TNT approaches, our watch and wait approaches, but sure, we'd love to do this again. Great, thank you so much. There's, there's so much in the topics of rectal cancer and colon cancer that we really could uh, go on and on, and we could probably develop several more virtual round table discussions, like you mentioned, uh, just stemming off of our conversation uh, today. Dr. Iqbal, thank you for an excellent talk. I want to commend you for all of the, the work you've done with quality improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when rectal cancer, uh, we started looking at total mesorectal rectal excisions, we focused on quality of the actual surgery, but we've gone way, way beyond that. And we're now looking at the preoperative, postoperative, and everything else that's associated with it, including ileostomies. Um, so I think that the looking at your data, uh, making changes and looking at how your numbers are affected um, is a great attribute to what quality uh, really is, um, not only in length of stay and cost, but also the morbidity uh, and mortality of our patients. And I've been able to witness that firsthand uh, as, our ileo as your ileostomy protocol has now been widely adopted as well as the ARAS protocol. So thank you very much. Um, again, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, before we finish, um, Baylor St. Luke's would like to recognize uh, and acknowledge uh, the following entities for their support um, for in today's program, the Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Neoplásicas INEN en Lima, Peru, Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia, Sociedad Peruana de Oncología Médica, Sociedad Peruana de Cancerología, Sociedad Mexicana de Oncología, Mexico City, Instituto Nacional de Cancer, INCAN, in Mexico City, Hospital San Javier Medical Education Department, in Guadalajara, Mexico, Cura, in Quito, Ecuador, Centro de Medicina Integral, C. Mater Dei, in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, Hospital Semesa Medical Education in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. Liga Hondureña contra el Cáncer de San, Pe San Pedro Sula en Honduras. Y Hospital Herrera Gerandi Medical Education in Guatemala City. Uh, lastly, I'd like to invite uh, everybody and all of our audience to connect to our ninth virtual round 
table on Thursday, September 17th at 6 p.m. Central Time or Houston Time. The title of the lecture will be Urologic Oncology. And this will be presented by Dr. Seth Paul Lerner, Professor of Urology and the Beth and Dave Sloan Chair of Urologic Oncology here at Baylor College of Medicine. He's also the Director of the Urologic Oncology and the Multidisciplinary Bladder Clinic Program and Faculty Group Practice Medical Director for the Urology Clinic at Baylor. To receive any updates and reminders, please subscribe to our CHI Baylor St. Luke's YouTube channel uh, where you'll be able to see all of these videos as well. Uh, thank you everybody and have a good night. Gracias. Good night. Gracias. Bye. Bye.